I started seeing things right from the age of three years, but I actually discovered my powers when I was ten. I got this curse and inheritance from my father. He was a psychic too, although his powers are very limited. He can sense things and seldom see them. However, in my case, I can feel them, see them, and worse, even talk to them. Psychic powers might sound cool to some of you, but believe me, there's nothing worse than that. When dead people come to you and try to talk to you, it isn't cool. And by dead people, I mean 70% of them are usually bad spirits and sometimes even demons. Demons are the worst. They break you down physically and mentally to the point where you lose the hope to live. Actually, my powers were initially, just like my father, limited too, but... In 2015, I was hexed by some close family friends, which they later confessed to. They did that out of jealousy. Lots of black magic and demonic spirits were involved. That event completely changed and messed up my life. Prior to that event, I was an extrovert, a bright guy who was top in my class and was liked by all. That event led to my skipping a whole year of school. I went from a highly social and extroverted guy to a highly introverted, closed behind four walls type of guy. I got into depression, dropped contact with all my friends except a few extremely close ones. But this wasn't the worst. After all, all these things are curable, right? But one thing isn't curable. You know what the experts in paranormal and demonology say? They say that once you closely experience the paranormal like a demonic possession, as it happened in my case, you develop some psychic abilities. Well, in my case, I was already a psychic, so no harm, right? Well, if you're thinking this, then you're wrong. My psychic powers got boosted multiple folds. I kind of became a portal for all the other worldlies, a kind of magnet for the paranormal. Let me give you a rough idea of how strong a magnet I am and what kind of stuff I usually go through. I was once visited by a spirit that lived around four to five miles away from me. Poor old guy was depressed. He died some fifty years ago. His sons killed him and then buried him on his own plot of land. It was some property matter. It told me that it felt strongly attracted towards me. Oh God, you got attracted towards me from a distance of four miles? That was my response. Some other time I was visited by a twelve-year-old who had died just a day before and was confused what was happening to him. Once, a demon visited me. He told me how he will get possession of my body, and then make me do terrible things to my sister and mother. Another time, I was visited by a lady, a witch I think, I'm not well versed with the paranormal terminology, who had those large hypnotic eyes. My father saw her too, before I tried to stab him in the chest with a huge knife. That night, I slept with my arms and legs tied to my bed. This is just nothing. There are some cases I can't even share with you guys. It's that messed up. A 17-year-old can't take more. I'm fed up. Completely fed up. This life, it's not what I wanted. I wanted a normal life, but somehow God decided to curse me with these terrible so-called powers. I often think about ending my own life, and demons teach me foolproof methods of doing so. I feel like I'm slowly losing the battle for my life. I feel like I'm slowly dying. There's an apartment my son and I used to live in that he calls the White House. It was weird, and I had a few interesting moments in it. A few days ago he reminded me of an experience that I had gratefully forgotten. His room was right next to mine, but the door to his room faced towards our kitchen, while mine faced towards our living room. There was a dining room in between the two, so quite a lot of space for us to move through. His closet was on the wall that connected to my bedroom, and I never felt very good about it, always making certain it was closed. One night, I kept having nightmares that something in his closet was coming out to try to get him. I would get up and run to get him, only to wake up at the beginning of the nightmare. These nightmares were mixed with sleep paralysis, which isn't new for me, so when I was able to fight my way out, I didn't really bother to check on him because I assumed it was my own issue. The fourth or fifth round of this cycle, I finally wake up for real, only to see my son run as fast as his four-year-old legs would carry him 
towards my bed. Behind him, I watched a legless, rotted corpse drag itself as fast as it could behind him. I jumped out of bed and pulled my son into a roll over my boyfriend at the time and tucked him next to the wall. When I looked back, it was gone. I never spoke about what I'd seen, and my son fell back to sleep right away. I laid there for the rest of the night wondering what had just happened. A few days ago, he walked up to me, he's seven now, and says, Hey mom, do you remember the night in the White House something came out of my closet and chased me to your room? I didn't really like my closet and that was really scary. The correlation looking back on it was just too strange to forget. So I'm currently living with my sister not too far off the south coast of Ireland. I fly back home in three hours and I've been here about three and a half weeks now. Thing is, her and her man got home from work around 1.30am about a week ago and while me and my sister were outside, we heard these terrible screams coming from a field over the way from us. We didn't tell her man the first night because he wouldn't have believed us anyway or would have said it was a fox getting a chicken. But the next night, he came running in after work saying how there's a screaming lady in the field. Each night since, at 2 a.m. ish, I've heard these screams, and if I stay up later, it progresses from screams into knocking. Knocking on my window, her window, and the front door. Like I said, I fly home in a few hours, my flight is at 6.20 a.m., so I was staying awake all night as I have to set out at like 4 a.m. anyways. So I'm sitting here watching YouTube on my phone, and what do I hear? That's screaming again. Immediately I grab my phone to record. It stops. Every single time I pull out my phone, the screaming stops. I am sitting here with the only light on for miles being the light in the room I'm sitting. I want to go outside to look, but it's pitch black with nothing but fields, and honestly, I'm actually a bit scared. I am determined to record these screams, and they are still happening now. We'll update if I manage to record it. What do I do? What would you do? I googled information about those screams, and apparently it's a forewarning of a death in the family, but no harm will be brought to me, but that noise sends shivers down my spine and makes every single hair on my body stand up. My mom and I both work at a very old, very haunted hotel. We used to be very open about our hauntings, but our current owner is a real jerk who refuses to acknowledge this, despite the business it could bring in, so we no longer put it in the brochures or broadcast it in any way. But I guess it makes it all the more convincing when guests tell us crazy stories, as they usually have no prior knowledge of the hauntings or even the history of this place which is a real shame because the building has some serious connections to incredible people who played a major part in founding the country. So a few weeks back, we were in the middle of our January law. Every year during that month, a lot of us get laid off because we're not needed, so it's pretty quiet around here between the lack of both guests and employees. However, this night we did have two guests check in, both of whom were local, and they were celebrating a special occasion as the guy had flowers delivered to the room before they checked in. They went to the restaurant to eat dinner, and then went to their room shortly after 9pm. At 10.45pm, my mom was startled to see them standing at the front desk with their luggage, looking pale and terrified. They were very reluctant to tell my mom what had happened, but said that they wanted to check out now and not wait until morning. My mom has seen this look on guests' faces before, and finally coaxed the truth out of the guy. Apparently they had went to bed a bit after 10pm and half an hour later they shot awake to a great crash and the sound of glass breaking. They scrambled out of bed and flipped the light switch on and couldn't believe what they saw. The massive heavy glass lamp on the bedside table had been knocked off and onto the floor where it lay in pieces next to the alarm clock as though someone had just taken their arm and swept the whole thing off in a rage. After seeing this, the couple grabbed their things and bolted out of the room. 
and when they were checking out, they were so embarrassed that they didn't even want a refund and refused my mom's offer to move them to another room, even though it would have been a huge upgrade. The woman just kept saying, I just want to sleep in my own bed tonight. And the guy told my mom, We might come back one day, but never again during the month of January when the hotel is nearly empty. My mom apologized as best she could for the craziness and checked them out, and she gave them a refund since they had only used the room for a very short while. When they left, she and a co-worker immediately went to visit the room and view it and found everything was just as they described. While they were marveling at the strangeness of it all, a faint sound nearly scared them to death. It was the woman's cell phone, vibrating under the sheets where she had left it in their frenzy to get out. They grabbed the phone and headed back to the front desk, where they were met by the guy coming to ask if they had found it. With his wife in the car waiting, he decided to open up a bit more to my mom about the incident as his wife was already terrified and he knew it would make it worse. He said that before they fell asleep, he had felt an undeniable sense of dread, as though something was going to happen. And when the sound first woke him up, he looked toward the foot of the bed and saw the silhouette of his wife standing there. He asked if she was okay and heard her voice answer right next to him. She was still in the bed. We've had people hear voices and music, see apparitions, and capture incredible images on camera, one of which was a young man dressed in a colonial era clothing, and you can see him clearly down to his hair and belt. But for someone or something to sweep a lamp and clock off of a table so hard it breaks the lamp is very unusual. Our phenomena is very rarely of the physical variety, so I am not sure what to make of this. I myself have never been frightened of whatever is here, maybe because I'm a history lover and would almost welcome the prospect of seeing someone from such a long gone era. As to who the woman was that this guy saw at the foot of his bed, I have no idea. We have a very well known female spirit in the hotel, supposedly from the era when it was a civil war hospital but the building also served as an elite college for women and of course was a home when it was first built. So it could be anyone, for all we know. My dad was traveling earlier this month. I won't say where, but it's a country very far away from us, which makes this even stranger. He was traveling with a hobby club of sorts, and one of the women he was with told him that after working with paranormal investigators, she developed a sensitivity. Over the past few years, she gained the ability to communicate on some level with certain deceased people. Later, I think the next day, she out of the blue asked him if he knew a young man with light hair who had passed. My dad said he had. She gave some other general descriptions, but nothing that was shockingly accurate. She said this young man had a message, and that the message was definitely meant to be passed on to my dad's daughter, aka me. His message was that a lot of people thought he changed before he died, but he wanted everyone to know that he hadn't. He was the same person, and she said that he couldn't pass on until his loved ones understood that. He also said to tell me that he never stopped caring about me, no matter what it seemed like. After much debate, my dad decided to pass this on to me. I got the biggest case of chills and teared up when I heard it. I've never been a believer in this kind of thing, but I've never disbelieved either. I've honestly actively avoided the paranormal because it freaks me out, but as soon as my dad heard this message, he assumed it was about my friend Bob. Bob was my best friend for many years. We had this amazing, unique friendship, and he felt more like family to me. I still miss him terribly. We never pursued a romantic relationship, but it was discussed at times, and I always felt like we might end up together one day. He had light brown hair that was dyed blonde when he passed. I don't want to go into too many details, but in the last few months before his death, he became very depressed and started to hang out with a dark crowd. We stayed close, but I didn't like these people, and didn't hang out with them or support his friendship with them. They ended up murdering him. The whole situation was crazy, bizarre, cruel, and absolutely horrifying. It was the hardest time of my life. It's been a long time, but I still don't go a day without thinking about Bob. The message does not make a lot of sense because we had drifted apart a little in those last months and he was going through a lot of emotional and mental issues. He was dressing differently, acting differently. 
I honestly felt like some of the people at his funeral, who were newish friends, didn't have any idea who he really was. I feel weird about this. I don't know how much I believe it, but in some ways I really want it to be true. In hard moments, I've prayed and prayed for some sort of connection with Bob. I just don't know what to do with this information. If he is stuck, I have no idea what to do with that. I can't speak to his other loved ones about this. I'm fairly religious, but they are even more so and probably wouldn't be open to it. Not to mention it would truly hurt them. They avoid many reminders of him to this day, including myself at times. Last night we were at our lake house and I fell asleep in the living room recliner around 2.20am. The house is open concept with one big room that serves as the living, dining, and kitchen area. I woke up startled but didn't know why. I had no realization that any kind of noise woke me but I felt weirdly scared. It was 3.15am so I hadn't been asleep long. I looked down and saw I was covered in the usual pile of dogs. There were two on my lap and the third was against me draped over the console of the recliner. Now as I looked up, I saw it. A black silhouette illuminated in the soft ambient light coming from the LED lights above the kitchen cabinets just a few feet away. Fear rose from deep inside me and I froze. My pulse quickened and my breath slowed as I stared at this figure in the quiet of my house. What I was clearly seeing was not a human being. Inexplicably, the figure was much too opaque and its head much too tiny. I saw no appendages. It had very broad shoulders and was wearing a black, thin, drapey garment with a hood. My fear grew as it turned towards me and I got the sense that it had suddenly become aware I was awake and watching. The figure didn't seem to have a face. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was fully awake. How was this happening? It didn't make any sense. There is something in our house. Fear consumed me. In the next split second, Boomer, my dog, woke up and sat upright on the console next to me and saw it too. We stared together as it turned back around and glided into my kitchen and just floated downward from view behind the kitchen island. My dog let out his loudest and most urgent alarm bark, a bark that rivals a dog four times his size. I jumped out of my skin. It was a deep, throaty bark reserved only for the most serious of threats to his family. Uncharacteristically, he didn't move a muscle to investigate the source of the threat either. He sat completely still next to me save for the moment of his continuous barking, a steady, rhythmic, one-bark drumbeat of alarm that I have not heard from him ever that seemed to rise in decibels at every breath he took. The loud bark woke my husband and he rushed from the bedroom still half asleep asking, What is it? What's wrong? Both Boomer and I still were frozen in place and I shrugged to spit out, uh, Um, there, there was something in the kitchen. Boomer saw it too. Th that's why he's barking his head off. It was right there. I knew it sounded crazy. I knew it was crazy. What was I saying? That I'd just seen a ghost? My husband was understandably puzzled. After he looked around the room and not the windows, he was satisfied there was nothing there. He said the security alarm was still set and it hadn't gone off, so no, there couldn't have been somebody in the kitchen. I didn't argue with him as I was trying to process what I had just experienced, so I let him go back to bed. As freaky scary as it was, it was over, and I went to bed too. Little did I know that things were about to get real. I was still awake when my cell phone rang at 3.28 a.m. and I shot straight up out of bed. A phone call at that time of the morning is never good. I reached for it, expecting bad news. The caller ID showed an 800 number. What? An 800 number at this hour? It was our alarm company. A feeling of dread swept over me. The same security company monitors both homes for us, so a call from them meant something bad was happening at our other house, the one we still have in the city. He said they had just received a front door alarm as well as a crawl space alarm. What? I wasn't understanding. What crawl space? There isn't one at the house in the city. Sensing my confusion, he asked if I was at the house on such and such drive. I froze. 
He was reading off the address of the lake house. The alarms were at the lake house. My heart fell to the floor and my mind started racing. Physically shaking, I said that yes, we were at the lake. We're fine and there's nothing wrong. I told him we haven't opened the front door and we certainly haven't opened the door to the crawl space under our back deck. Our alarm has now even gone off inside the house. I thanked him and hung up the phone. Now my husband was wide awake. He hurriedly got dressed and did a sweep of the house and the crawl space. He found nothing. I couldn't go back to sleep and I stayed awake the rest of the night wondering about the spirit in black that visited me. The one who was freely walking around our house while we slept and apparently tripping the security alarms too. I called the alarm center back today and they gave me even more frightening information. At exactly 3.27 a.m., they had four alarms come in. One, front door breach. Two, dining room glass breakage breach. Three, front guest bedroom glass breakage breach. And four, crawl space breach. We have a service call in for our alarm system to be checked out, but I'm doubtful they're going to find a thing wrong with it. Several other alarm zones didn't go off, including the back door, so it seems unlikely it's a whole system failure. I've tried to think of anyone I have known who has passed recently and have come up empty. Nobody really fit. Maybe I didn't know them personally. Maybe they are just connected to the house. That felt more likely in my gut. We bought this lake house in foreclosure after the original owner had left to go back to the bank. He had designed the house himself, had it built, and for 16 years had enjoyed it on the weekends and vacations, frequently hosting big parties. He was the only owner. That is, until his life fell apart from his drinking. His wife left him, and he became a bad alcoholic. Wanting to check on every possibility, I did a Google search on him. Yes, it's what you're thinking. The original homeowner died a few months ago. He was only 53. On his memorial page, nearly every comment mentioned how much he loved the lake, loved the lake house, and loved hosting his friends here. I feel like this spirit is more unhappy with us than just loss between two worlds. My gut is telling me that he is unhappy with how his life went, and he is jealous that we're now living in his home where he had so much fun. We have performed clearing rituals by smudging and by salting, asking him to never return. That is our first otherworldly encounter. Is there anything else we should do? We are so creeped out, I'm having trouble sleeping, and I don't want to be alone in this house. I recently went with my mother to her job just to get a feel for the place since I'll likely be working there soon. She's a groundskeeper at the university. Basically, the university buys up nearby homes to expand itself, and they bought up this elderly man's home after he died. A really big, two-bathroom, three-bedroom, managing to fit on one floor and a basement. It's been stripped down to a few curtains and a piece of furniture or two. The groundskeeper basically used the home as a massive break room, I stayed there for about seven hours a week or two ago and I got freaked out. For starters, there's a big empty room with a small table and two chairs in one corner and right in the middle of it is a small chandelier. Well, After about 30 minutes of getting settled in the home, I started to walk around and that chandelier was slightly moving back and forth. I'm unsure if this was the elderly man or not, but there was nothing I can think of other than the elderly man that could have moved it. It was a freezing day out so all the windows and doors were shut. There's a single fan in the house that I can recall and it wasn't on. I specifically checked once I noticed the swinging. About an hour later I get the courage to go down into the massive basement since I was so bored. There are no lights down there despite there being three massive rooms in total plus a bathroom down there. Before I went in I took a picture at the top of the stairs looking down. I don't know if my mind is messing with me but I swear to God there's a face at the bottom. I can't post the pictures here because I don't have the picture on my mobile and my mobile app is complete crap and for my final evidence what haunting goes on without unexplained footsteps. After going down the basement and barely going past the steps before running back up them again I hear distant but loud footsteps. About four footsteps on hardwood with about half a second in between each step. They sounded like they were on the other side of the house, 
Keep in mind it's a very echo-prone house due to there being nothing but wooden floors and big open spaces, so it may have been anywhere. Tomorrow, I'll be going there again for about the same amount of time. What should I do? Should I ask it anything? Should I leave it alone? I kind of want to interact with him a bit more since those who knew him said he was a nice guy. This might be one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me, but some of you might have experienced similar things. This happened sometime in 2013, I think, when I was around 19. I had my room in the basement in my dad's house. It was late, and I had laid there in bed in complete darkness. I needed to sleep because I had school the day after, but as usual, I felt too energetic to sleep. So I lay there for a while when I suddenly heard something. I opened my eyes, but like I said, it was completely dark. Then I heard it again, a scratching noise. It went on, getting more and more intense, and I quickly realized the sound came from under my bed. My eyes were widened, and a panic started spreading through my body. Did I leave one of the cats in here before I went to sleep? I thought. Then I started feeling it. Something scratched and punched at the mattress from underneath. I could feel it across my back. I didn't know what to do. I was in total shock. After I had been there for at least half a minute without the scratching having stopped, my fear eventually turned to rage. I threw myself out of bed, turned on the lights, threw myself on the floor looking under the bed and screamed, What do you want from me? Nothing was there. I looked around the room. There was absolutely no one in there. A friend of mine moved into our house a couple of months ago after this. She rented a room from us on the top floor. After she had been here for three nights, she told me she had the craziest experience as she was going to sleep the night before. I could almost feel my skin turn pale as she told the story of the exact same thing that had happened to me. The scratching, the punches against the mattress. I knew for sure that I had never told her about that experience. We were both really freaked out when I told her the exact same thing had happened to me two floors down months earlier. I want to start off by saying that I have never believed in heaven or hell, or any of the various supernatural myths and legends. Ever since I was young, science has always been my bias, and even after everything that happened in the story that is about to follow, I think it still is. Even after everything, I'm still not sure I believe in it, but what I do know is that it was real. I saw it. I felt it. In my junior year of high school around 2011 or 2012, I can't remember exactly when during that year, but I know it was within that time frame, my friends and I were into doing a lot of stupid things that teenagers tend to do. You name it, we more than likely did it. Just like every other teen, drinking and partying was our favorite pastime, especially on weekends. However, one weekend of being a stupid teenager has changed my life forever. I'm not really sure where to start, so I'm just going to jump in by walking through the night. Our group got together, about five of us, and we all somehow came up with a decision to go explore in our state's most haunted cemetery. Why not, right? Something fun to do in our small city, I suppose. One of my friends had a Ouija board, and she decided it would be a fun thing to do while we partied. We loaded up my car with all of our alcohol and, of course, that Ouija board, and we were looking forward to a good night. Fast forward to about 30 minutes later, we're on the clear opposite side of the city, and we're out in the middle of literally nowhere. No lights, no houses, just the stars and headlights lighting our way down this admittedly creepy winding road. A little backstory about the cemetery first. Like I said before, it is said to be the most haunted in our state, and it's been investigated by several paranormal investigators and teams, and all of them have come up with the conclusion that there is indeed something there. Eyewitness testimonies state nearly the same kind of phenomenon, a force pushing you off the wall that surrounds the cemetery if you decide to try to walk on it, a shadowy figure that lurks in the woods in the back, mysterious orbs shown up in photographs, etc. This graveyard is the resting place of hundreds of people, from old governors, children, to Civil War soldiers who died in battle. 
The oldest grave there is reported to go back to the 1700s. It was reportedly gorgeous and well-maintained back in its prime, but it has since fallen apart and nobody watches the grounds or does any sort of monitoring. For the curious who go to visit it, they have to park their car on the main road, aka the only road that leads to the side of town it's on, climb a chain that is meant to keep people out, and then walk down a two-mile dirt road that leads to the front gates. Once at the gates, you have to climb the infamous five-foot brick wall that surrounds the cemetery as the front gates are chained locked. We pull up to the dirt road, we get out, and we start our trek. Once at the front gates, I don't know if anyone else felt it, but I could immediately feel that something was off, but something drew me in. We all helped each other over the wall and once we were all in, the party began. We ran around screaming and yelling for the ghost to come at us, and we went hunting for the shadowy figure that was supposed to have been seen. We walked around the wall and the only time anyone fell off was because they were too drunk to keep their balance. Needless to say, none of us saw anything and none of us heard anything, and no one had been pushed off the wall by invisible hands. We then decided to give the Ouija board a go. With the Ouija board in my hand, something drew me to a grave that was a little way towards the very center of the cemetery. We all sat around the grave, and of course we placed the board on top of it. We asked the typical questions, as we expected. Nothing happened. Eventually we grew bored, sober, and out of things to do, so we decided to head home. I dropped everyone off at home, and then I got back to my house. I passed out. The next few days went by, and they were just normal school days. But then, something changed. One night, I went to sleep, and my life changed forever. I woke up from my sleep, or at least I thought I did, but I quickly learned that I hadn't. I will always remember how vivid it was and how it felt to look at myself sleeping in my bed. Whatever this place was, was real. It wasn't a dream, and it wasn't real life. I was looking at real life. After a few moments of looking around my room and watching myself sound asleep, something began pulling me towards my window, which is right next to my bed. I remember thinking I can't go to the window, the bed is in the way. But then, it wasn't. I didn't go around my bed, I wasn't standing on top of my bed, I was through my bed. Before I could process what was going on, my hand began to reach for my curtain and I tried to fight it feeling fear beginning to engulf my body. It was no use trying to resist it though. My hand drew back the curtain and my eyes were glued out onto my street and to the street light that stands right outside my window. There stood a little boy, no more than four years old, just looking at me. He wore clothes from an older time, that was obvious, and before I could really come up with an explanation, something grabbed his hand and pulled him away. I woke up instantly and saw that it was time for me to get ready for school. However, I remember everything that had just happened. Whatever I saw, it was and still is ingrained in me. I tried not to think about it and just tried to tell myself that it was just a dream, but that didn't do any good. For the next few nights I had the same exact dream or whatever you want to call it, and after about a week or so, it changed. Instead of having the urge to look out my window, I was looking at myself, sound asleep in bed, with my back towards my open room. Yes, this fact is important later on. Something told me to turn around, and so I did. There he was. The little boy was standing in my room. He reached his hand up to me, and looked like he was scared. I reached for his hand, but when I came within centimeters from grabbing it, the little boy changed. He was not a little boy anymore. I have no clue what he turned into, but whatever it was, it was dark, evil, and full of hatred. It wasn't another being, it was just a dark cloud. I remember screaming, but as I screamed there was no noise, no commotion. Nobody came rushing into my room to ask what was wrong. And then seconds later, I woke up in my bed just like a child wakes up from a nightmare. I look around and turned all my lights on, there was nothing there. This horrible reoccurring nightmare happened for the next few nights, and eventually I refused to sleep. I got sick, depressed, anxious, I stopped eating, and I quit taking care of myself. My grades slipped, and I started to become an angry person. It got to the point that I felt like I needed to go to church. Me. 
Someone who has never been to church had no other option left and needed to figure out what was wrong with me. I sat down and talked to a priest and explained everything to him. He asked me if I had ever dwelled in, studied, or investigated in anything demonic or paranormal in general. Then I remembered the cemetery. My oh crap moment was clearly picked up by him and he asked what all we did, so I told him. He explained how spirits can be brought into the world through things like that. Now this priest isn't a demonologist, and he doesn't investigate in anything paranormal, so he was little to no help in trying to find a solution. He merely just reminded me of that one night. I called my friend when I left, and because there was still daylight outside, I talked her into going back to that graveyard with me, and on the way there I explained everything to her. She's always been religious, so she believed me. We got back out there, and once we were in the cemetery, I walked back to the grave that we had done the Ouija board on. And there he was. His name was Samuel Diamond. Born 1859, died 1863. Four years old. I rushed home, and I did research, and I began looking into legends, myths, solutions, and testimonies. One solution I came across was to burn the Ouija board. The Ouija board that I had completely forgotten about was still sitting in the trunk of my car. Without a second thought, I started the fire pit in the backyard and I threw it in, anxious to rid myself of whatever was going on. But then it got worse. I guess worse isn't really the correct term to use. I guess you could say that it stayed consistent. Yes, the weird out-of-body dreams did in fact stop, but something else took its place. Feelings. Not your typical emotions, but more like sensing. Ever since I burned that Ouija board, and even now to this day, I can't stop sensing. If you know the feeling of being able to tell that someone is looking at you, then you know what I'm talking about. Whatever time of day it is, wherever I am, and whatever I'm doing, if there is something or someone there, I can feel them. At night, I can't fall asleep if my back is towards my open room. And if I happen to turn that way in my sleep, then I immediately wake up. If I'm lying in bed trying to fall asleep or just relaxing, sometimes I feel like if I turn to look at what is driving a hole through me with its eyes, I might be killed. Sometimes if I'm wide awake or trying to sleep, because I know this can be construed as sleep paralysis, it feels like my neck will literally be broken if I turn to look. Sometimes tears from fear start rolling down my face. I'll admit, these extreme cases haven't happened in a long time, but the mild ones still do. Upon further investigation, I read that burning a Ouija board, while it can be useful once the user has said goodbye, can release everything that was trapped inside of it through the initial use. I made a mistake when I was a stupid teenager, and I didn't fix it in the right way. For that, my life is forever changed. I've come to learn that the world is more complex than we can imagine, and there are no limits when it comes to the physical plane. The deepness of our universe and all of the different layers of all the different planes are beyond human imagination. Anything is literally possible. There are some things out there, and this goes against everything that I believe, that can't and will never actually be proven by science. Sometimes the only proof you can get is the proof that is personally given to you, even if that means that it's presented with a beautifully wrapped box with nothing but darkness inside of it. Goodbye, and rest in peace, Samuel Diamond, 1859 to 1863. This happened to my mom, but since she would never write about it on here, I figured I would. I'd like to mention that my mom does not believe in ghosts, schools, goblins, or anything in between. In fact, her and my dad tease me quite a bit for all the paranormal stuff I like to watch and read. The fact that this happened to my mom validates it even more in my mind because she isn't someone to come up with stories just for the fun of it. I've heard this story quite a few times over the years, but I actually sat my mom down to tell me this because I wanted to make sure I got all the details and info correct. I recorded the story on my phone so I could listen to it while I wrote it to make sure all the info was correct. My mom was 16 at the time, which makes this story set in 1988. 
She was visiting her great-grandma and other relatives with her mom and siblings in Copperton, Utah. While there, they went by the BYU campus in Provo for the day, and while she was there, she ran into an old friend from California who invited her to a dance that night. After spending the day in Provo, they went back home, and later that night, my mom drove the family minivan by herself to the dance. Provo to Copperton is about a 50-minute drive, give or take a few minutes, and back then, she didn't have a cell phone she could pull up Google Maps on. She got there fine and had a great time, but when she left, it was around 11 or 12 at night. Anyone who has driven through Utah at night knows that some of the roads can get really dark in the middle of nowhere, and my mom found herself lost on her drive home after the dance. Copperton was, and still is, a pretty rural area with a lot of deserted streets, highways, with no street lights. For the life of her, she could not figure out how to get home and couldn't remember the directions. She knew she was somewhat close because she could recognize the copper mines, but she was a teenager and panicked about being lost with no way to contact someone to help her get home. She didn't know if she had driven too far and had passed where she needed to go, or if she was going in a completely different direction than home. She told me to remember that it was at 12 on a Saturday night in Utah, so she really did feel like the only one out there since it was pretty empty on the streets. She ends up coming across a gas station, 7-Eleven off the freeway in the middle of nowhere. There wasn't any other buildings around, but she finally saw the lights and knew she could ask the cashier at the 7-Eleven directions home. As she went inside, she realized she didn't know her great-grandma's phone number or address, so she just asked how to get to Copperton. Even though she really only ended up not too far away from home, the dude was useless and couldn't give her any directions that would help. One thing my mom noticed when she had spotted the gas station was that there were no cars around. I don't know if the cashier got a ride or not, but she was very clear that there were absolutely no cars or buildings around, just this lonely 7-Eleven off the main highway. She was wondering if she could just keep driving around, but she hopped into the van and sat in there for a few, just wanting to be somewhere that had lights while she tried to figure out what to do. As she was in the car, she hears a knock on her window, and a man was standing outside the car. She hadn't seen this man in the store and the surrounding area, and was a little startled, but she rolls down the window. He asks my mom, Did I hear you were looking for directions to Copperton? My mom says yes, and he tells her that he could give her some directions. My mom gets a little piece of paper and pen from inside the car, and he writes the directions down for her. She thanks him, puts the paper down on the console, and looks in the rearview mirror to make sure he wasn't behind her car when she pulls out, but she couldn't find him. She said he wasn't walking away. There was no car or anything. She said she wondered if he went into the 7-Eleven, but didn't see him there through the windows. I thought it was creepy that he just disappeared, but my mom said she was more worried about hitting him. She thought it was odd, but the weirdest part was his directions. They were so specific to get home from the very spot they were, there was no way a random person would know them and be able to write them all down for her. An example my mom gave me of what they were like is this. You go to the left, there will be a four-way stop, go to the right, and four miles down the road turn left. The directions didn't actually go to her grandmother's exact house, but it got her close enough into town that she could remember how to get back. I asked her what he looked like, but she says she has no recollection since it was so long ago. The most she could give me was that he seemed like a completely normal guy, probably in his 40s. I guess he was so normal looking that he didn't really stand out to her in any way over the years. I asked her if she thought he was a ghost, but she said no. It's worth mentioning that she is religious and thought that he was sent to help her, and she had been praying many times that night that she could find her way home or get help. Regardless if she thought it was an angel or someone compelled by higher powers to help her, I still get chills when I think about it, and it definitely is creepy to me. I am not particularly religious, but I love all things paranormal, so it is a bit comforting to imagine a guardian angel helping my mom out that night. Who knows what it was? A guardian angel? Hitchhiking ghost? Or some random guy who gets his kicks spending his nights in a small gas station in the middle of nowhere in Utah? All I know is that I'm glad my mom ran into whatever he was, and not something more sinister. Hey friends, thanks for listening. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, rletsreadofficial, 
and give and receive feedback from the community. Be sure to check out my Choose Your Own Path horror game on the iOS and Android App Store, and grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon. Links in the description. Thanks so much again, friends, and I'll see you again soon.